on the latest episode of the PCT podcast, we are delighted to be joined by Mark Rees, um, a fantastic technical coach who's worked with some of the best athletes in, in the world of football. We're going to go through his career to date uh, and see where, what he's up to during lockdown 2.0. So without further ado, Mark, thank you for joining us today on the PCT podcast. Thank you for uh, inviting me on here today, mate. Super, mate. Obviously, as we mentioned there, we've just come out of lockdown 2.0. Um, how are you finding that? How has that affected what you're, what you're doing at the minute? I think it's been hard for everyone to do anything. Um, even football clubs, it's been hard. You know, never mind someone who does something individually. Um, either working with players or, or dealing with players. It's, 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 I, think, I think the one thing for me, what, what it's done is, is for me, day to day, it, it's, it's not slowed me down. It's probably restricted me. Um, probably working with more people than more people than what I'd like to work with at times, and the fact that you're restricted to small numbers, aren't you? That's the thing with the group sizes, and you know, um, I think some of the kids and some of the the, the, the talented young kids who who are at academies, I think they've they've you know been restricted because if you're not academy, you've been out of train because you're classed as an elite athlete, you know, from 15. And then, obviously, you know, senior players, they've, they've continued to play. But a few lads who are playing, like, non-league, um, they've, they've been hitting the grass quite a lot. So, it, it's, it's kept me busy. I've had to adapt. Um, I've had to be creative with the way I work. Um, it's gave me a little bit of time to, to probably look after myself a little bit more, train, you know, do a bit more running, a bit more gym myself. Um, so yeah, interesting times, and hopefully now you know we're through it, and we can start to get back to a bit of normality. Yes, fingers crossed. For, for anybody that who might not be aware, can you just give us a little bit of an insight into, into what it is you, you are up to at the minute? So, uh, well, I'm in, I'm in between. Um, I've I've got various things what I'm involved with at the minute. So so obviously my background's coaching. I've been in, I've, I've coached, I've played. Um, for for a long long time, and um, I made a choice. Um, it was probably about twelve months ago. Um, I was due to start um, a full time role at a football club, and I had an issue with my heart. Um, so so I then had to stop coaching, stop working, um, and and I had to assess everything. Which, which, which was a big part of, you know, a massive, massive part of my life where I've never been able to not put my boots on, never not been able to deal with players, never been able to not go to football matches. Um, so, so when I was past fit then, I had options then of what I wanted to do. So, so what I've been doing at the minute is I've been working basically as a consultant. Um, so helping players, guiding players. Um, yeah. I've been dealing with brands. I've been helping support them to recruit players for for you know endorsements and stuff like that. Um, I've done recruitment for for national teams for for football clubs, um, and 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 I've just kept busy. You know, working with players day to day. Um, technically, you know, you, you know my bread and butter and and where I started and where I got a big interest in football. Was was my passion to, to to deal with players and develop them technically, um, either individually or collectively in small groups, and that stuff which has you know stood with me and and stays with me to this day and and within the professional game, within the academy game, within the women's game, um, I get a lot of people who do come to me for support and advice within that area. You know whether that's someone who's having a bit of a bad time whether that's someone who's moved football club and they don't get the amount of work within that area, what they used to get um, as much and they need to top up. Or sometimes, you know, if someone's been injured um, and and the, or they're in between football clubs, they're in between moving and they want to sharpen up. You know, there's, there, there's so many different reasons why people do come across and get in touch with me. It sounds like you're a very busy busy man and obviously juggling that is, is, is something that you're, you're very good at at the minute. Before we sort of get into the crux of, of, of today's conversation, which is that being creating a, a technical proficiency, let's have a chat of, of your experiences to date. When was it that you first 
really got the bug for coaching more. When when was the first time you thought? So that? so 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 I um I was at Crow Alexander from from eight till nineteen twenty years of age. But when I was when I was fourteen, I actually moved to Crew. Um, okay. So you know, for anyone who knows Crew, you know parts of it in the middle of nowhere. Mm-hmm. So from a social point of view. You know, once once we trained during the day and I've been to school, there were certain evenings in the night where, you know, I was bored. So what I was doing was, like any young aspiring player, was going back to the training ground, lacing balls everywhere, smashing balls off crossbars, killing coaches' sessions by just pinging balls everywhere. And, um, and, and, and eventually, you know, like I ended up just floating around the training ground again. And... Um, Dario at the time, you know, said to me, he went, he went, what you like with kids? I went, what do you mean what you like with kids? He's like, come over here. And he had like under nines. He said, do some of them skills what you do. I said, what do you mean some of them skills? He's like, you know, some of them flicky things you do, what I tell you not to do all the time. <laughs> so, 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 so it was like, all right, okay. So next thing, I've got a group of like 15 kids who, you know, by the end of the hour, they're all clinging off my back going, oh, can we do more of that? Can we do more of that? And then that really then was like the ignition of my coaching career and the fact that because I was injured early, um, it, it it gave me something which I was still involved in football, whereas a lot of players, when they're injured, you lose football because you, you've got no reason to be there, you know, other than going to the gym or rehab and stuff like that. So what actually happened was... was um, I stayed at Crew, and then when I was at Crew, I left Crew. Went, I went out, and then I come back. But even when I left the club to go out and play somewhere else, I was still coaching. So I'm still turning up on a Sunday morning. Now I didn't get paid a penny till I was 17 to coach, and when I was 17, I was earning more from my coaching than I was from a job right. playing because of you know your scholarship or you for YTS at the time, what they used to call it. And um, it wasn't the money, but but one thing was, I really, really enjoyed it. And I really, really enjoyed, you know, being on the side of the pitch and, 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 and being able to communicate with the kids and inspiring the kids. And, and, and as the years went on, you know, I went to work with people like Steve Holland for years and years and years and years. You know, and Steve's done unbelievably well. But, but, you know, when I was there, that was like, it was it was it was the old school way, mate. Which like you know, if you were putting a session on, and I see a lot of stuff going on, and you know, grassroots is unbelievable, and you know, everyone knows a lot about football, but we all can improve. But when I look back now, which is 16, 17 years ago, is like, and look at that individual, and that individual is a confident, you know, quite self-assured young lad. I was putting a session on, and Dario Grad is going, get off the pitch now. Someone might think, well, that's quite abrupt. Or next time I put a session, he goes, no, 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 do it like this. But them days, because of them blunt conversations, because of them, you know, um, them, them, them huge drops of advice, that that shaped me as a person, as in gave me a little bit of resilience, you know, um, made me open-minded into developing and learning and listening and watching. Because I think sometimes a lot of people are willing to listen and learn, but then actually, are you listening and learning, or are you just ready to say what you need to say? And, and you know, you've got to strip yourself back. And, and being at that football club at the time, you know, I was lucky when I moved on my career and went to other clubs because you you strictly focused on one role. Whereas when you was at Crew, you know, you're getting there, you're setting your session up, you you getting the kit out, you're pumping the balls up, you're moving the goals. You're putting the cones out. You're doing a register, yeah. You're doing the session. Then you're speaking to the parents. Then everything what you've put out, you're bringing back in, mm-hmm. you know. So, so you're the kit man. You're the bloody welfare officer, you know. So, so for me, it was like a real good schooling because it, 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 it you know, it wasn't just coaching. There's more to just coaching. It was the preparation. It was the organisation. What you needed to have. It was it was the ability to communicate and and work as a team with other people to make sure that you were sorted and that group of players didn't know anything different. They just thought you were there to coach. But it's all the work prior and after the sessions, which for me, you know, just as important as what goes on the pitch. And um, 
that's where I started anyway. Sorry, that's where I started, and and you know, um, I had some great years there, some fantastic years at Crew. To be fair, you, you've touched on quite a lot that, that we were going to discuss in terms of like your first coaching role and your pathway, uh, and also what was it that sparked it. So at, at that age, as a player, then seeing all these young young children wanting to do all these, as as you alluded to, some of those skills you do, yeah. did that did that resonate with you that actually I'm I'm I've got something here that I can offer back to to the future generation. Yeah, a million percent. I mean, listen, you know, I was lucky where where I grew up. Um, where I grew up as a, as a as a lad in the area I grew up, there was like a group of a six or seven lads who went to different schools, but we were all the same year group. You know, three, four of them were playing the Premier League. You know, some of them played and dropped out, but we were competitive. So, so every single one of us, if we weren't working hard on our own, we were working hard with each other or trying to beat each other and, and you know, I think when, when I went coaching and I started the coaching, it, it because of, in a way, I wanted to be the best coach at that age and I'm only 17. There's people have been doing it for 25 years and, you know, I don't think, you know, there's a fine line when you're young between confidence and arrogance and, and I think I had that balance but, but the one thing was, was, I didn't understand structure. If you look at coaching now, you've got technical, tactical, physical, you know, psychological, and, and not, none of them words were really floating about then. Um, so, so for me, it was like, I could do an hour session, but you, when you look back and you reflect, you're like, bloody hard to get away with that. But on the other side of it, it's like the one thing I've always been, is, you know, I loved the ball as a kid. Um, I used to travel to Leeds and work with a guy called Simon Clifford. He used to run, he set up the Brazilian soccer schools. So, you know, you're talking a, like, a, like a football disallowed ball, which is like a futsal ball. And we used to get thousands of touches on that stuff now from that work. It's the type of work which still to this very day now, you know, I've got first team footballers, Premier League players, um, you know, Ballon d'Or. You know, I had a Ballon d'Or player when I was at City, you know, um, World Cup winners working just individually with the ball and and you know I think the biggest thing is for me when I was younger was I loved the, the players being on the ball but I probably didn't have a real good tactical understanding of, of why I was doing it you know I just wanted them to improve on the ball but then when I reflect back I think now because there's so much knowledge in, in my head and, and the experiences and the people and the courses and what other CPD I've done is actually it's quite unique because all I wanted players to do was be dominant one v one with the ball, like and be able to kick the ball right and left and be dominant. Now there wasn't anything else in that, so it was up to the players to have decision making then. Um, but you know, fantastic times, great times, and uh, great times, and um, you know, it, it was a great learning curve for me, unbelievable learning curve. And, and, and from your time at, at Crew, you, you had the academy coaching role and the scouting role. So, what would you say that your, your average week looked like, and, and what was the biggest thing that you, you took from that role? When I was at Crew, so <laughs> I, I, as as you can probably hear my voice, you know, I've always been really proactive. So, so you know, um, I, I think you know anyone who's at a football club at a young age or an older age, or it doesn't matter where you've been there for ten years, twenty years. You know, you've, if you're wearing a badge on your chest, you, you, you've got to have that, that sense of pride and you've got to have belief, you know, and you've got to believe in yourself that you can make a change. And when, when, when I was younger, uh, when I was at Crew, like I started off just doing under eights um, and we were doing Monday, Wednesday, Sunday. That was the first setup. Two hours, two hours, game on a Sunday. Um, and then because of, I'd like to think, my ability and other people like Neil Crixley and James Collins, who's now at Wolves. Um, I mean, Neil's the Blackpool manager now, you know. Um, like, look, we want you to come in, you know. And, and openly, I needed to work more on the 11-11 stuff and get a better understanding, not of the game or the knowledge of what I had, but being able to transfer that knowledge and to conduct it and communicate it to players. Um, through different practices, through through manipulating practices, and so 
I was so lucky to work with some of the people I work with. And then, so what happened then was rather than just coming in and doing two hours, I was doing two sessions. So I was doing the under eights, then I was doing the under 16s, like on Monday, Wednesday. And then I was coming in Friday night and doing a session with the under 12s and under 13s. Um, then I was coming in Saturday morning to do the games with the 16s. And then I was in Sunday. So I was still part time, but then, you know, you're in every other day, you know. Um, and I lived in Manchester at the time when I left the club. So it was an hour there and then it's an hour back. So six hours in your day, it's like a full time job. Um, and, and crew, to be fair, were great with me. They were brilliant. You know, they invested in me. I invested a lot into the club in the fact that they recruited a lot of players for them. Um, so, and, and you know, it, it was probably, you know, when I look back, probably some of the best times what I've had in football. Yeah. What's, what's interesting there, it's saying that you, you've gone from that part-time role of two hours, two hours a game, and then all of a sudden you're being thrust from the under-8s to the under-16s straight after. What Was there any differences that you saw from coaching an under-8 to an under-16? I, I think the biggest thing is, like, you know, certain people, you know, now you've got this, you know, the structure in everything in football. You've got the EPPP. You know, the EPPP wasn't in that. So, you know, football clubs were free to de develop players however they like without interference and without, you know, obviously I think it's great that every club is is governed and, and screened and stuff like that. But then also I think, you know, it's like running a business. You should be able to run that business how you like. And um, at the time, you know, for me, you know, I've always, outside of crew, I set like a little coaching business up as well where I was dealing with six formers. I was going into... I was going into school playgrounds. I was going into some of the nicest places and I was going to the most deprived places. So I think the biggest thing for me wasn't my knowledge, which got stretched. It was, it was learning to communicate differently. It was learning to, to, you know, the way which you conduct yourself and how you hold the group, uh, your manners, you know, your mannerisms. If you're, if you're with a 16 year old boy, no disrespect, you're playing Man United or Chelsea or Arsenal at the weekend, 11 by 11, but then you've got the under eights who you want to invite into the club and you want them to feel comfortable and the families to be comfortable. Well, you've got to wear two different hats, as in your, your approach, but you still, if you've got that knowledge, you need to be able to transfer it. And, and you know, I, 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 I think for me, with the type of person I am, because I enjoy being around people and talking to people, um, my biggest issue when I look back was over talking, like stepping in and talking and talking just because maybe I wanted to, you know, when I was younger, I wanted to not just give them a bit. I wanted to show them that that knowledge was there. But then also you got to think about keeping players warm. You've got to think about the time span of the sessions. Um, so, so there was a lot to be learned when that stage, that process first started. Um, and, and, you know, as that time went on and, you, and the players get to know and you, get, and you say less because they have that expectation and they know what they're going to get. Um, so, yeah, yeah, it, 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 there was a big difference as in the speed of the session, the physicality, uh, the, 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 the creativity side as in, you know, creating stuff out of nothing, you know. Um, there was a big thing around, you know, defending, you know, off the ball. Um, when you talk to younger kids, a lot of the stuff is with the ball. Um, so, you know, great, great experience, great opportunities to work with the people I've worked with. You know, they've gone on and done, done some unbelievable things. I think everyone who's at that time period at football club is either still there in a senior position or have gone on and got some kind of accolade or made a massive difference to some of the biggest players in football. It sounds like a really exciting time of your life at a crew. You then spent a year with, with Blackburn in, in, in a range of roles again, pre-academy, foundation phase, as well as the, the technical development coach. Talk to us a little bit about your time at Blackburn and, and what the week looked like there with those different gym roles. So so when Blackburn come about, um, when Blackburn come about, um, the I went in specifically to, to work with the under 18, the youth team, to work with them technically and to develop 
and 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 recruit players of a high level from under eights to under elevens. It was like the foundation phase as such now. So a big big thing at the time was was the club were working a certain way within a program. Um, and and you know from my point of view, I wanted a balance between players being able to pass and move the ball and tactically be astute, but then also individually being you know um, creative, comfortable, um, two footed, uh, being able to play with a head up. Um, so so that took a bit of time. So so when I first originally went in, all I was doing was in the mornings I was with the 18s. Um, and then in the evening, during the day, I was just planning my stuff and getting the group sorted for the evening stuff, which was under eights, under nines, under tens, under elevens. Um, and that was working in formats of like 5v5, 7v7, 9v9. Um, and it was like working with someone else, another guy who's, who's at Everton now, who's a great guy called Mike Cribbley, who does the recruitment there. And Cribs did the recruitment and I did the coaching. And, and what we tried to do was mould a a group of people um, who who we thought were good coaches, but but we really wanted to see you know how far they could come was in, could they change and 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 really buy into the program of what we're trying to bring in. It was like revamping it, if I'm being honest, at the time, um, and it worked. That 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 initial first group of players we had, um, unfortunately, when I left and when he left and clubs situations change you know financially or the leagues are in and stuff funding goes people leave you know that's the way the world is a lot of them players have left now but at that point we recruited some of the best kids in the country and some of them kids now are the best kids in the country unfortunately they're not all at Blackburn Rovers anymore you know they're dotted around and they've moved on but that was the fruits of the work at the time and, and you know, anyone who knows football and knows players and, and knows that area of when we were there, you know, we, we created a solid, solid group of coaches. We had real strong um, and, and long-term talent, you know, players who might not be showing now, but, but long-term had so much potential to come. Um, and and you know that was that was some great times there, uh, some unbelievable times at Blackburn. Um, and then as that went on, then the Triple P came in, and that's when it became structured. Um, and we end, I ended up then heading up the foundation phase. That was like my final role. I ended up heading the foundation phase. Uh, it, it must have been as, as a local lad from Manchester, then a really proud moment that, that that when you got the opportunity for for Manchester City, how how did that role come about? <laughs> So um, I'm actually a United fan. So, oh, so okay. I grew, I grew, I grew up watching Man United. My old man is the the staunchest United fan you've ever seen in your life. Like, can you say anything about United? He's having you. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And um, so, basically, you know, someone someone approached me, said, "Look, you know, uh, there's a technical technical coach role at the football club." You're great for it. The thing as well, what was happening was outside of Blackburn, I was also working privately. So I had 20 or 60 players coming to me privately. And, and you know, I think I think one of the big things was there were 20 of Man City's best players and, and players who've shown a lot of talent and a lot of potential. So yeah. if, you, if they're happy and they're saying what's good is good and other people know what's good is good, then... You know, they they became quite p persistent then, and that's 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 when I decided to move over. Um, and then when I moved across, um, obviously, a funny story this actually. So when I moved across, obviously, I couldn't tell anyone anything until it happened. So walked in, you know, agreed whatever. So walk out, got the kit. First place to go to is me old man's. Knock on the door, like knock on the door, like all right, dad. What the, have you got on there? What do you mean? I said, I'm dying for the loo, let me in. He went, you're going nowhere with that kit on. And I'm not lying, it was like winter time now. Maybe strip off at the doorstep, yeah. The neighbours outside, you're not bloody coming in. And it took about two months before he'd let me in with the gear on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no way. No way. So, 
<laughs> during your role there then, as well as that, obviously, that thought in the back of your mind as a United fan, but you spent it as a technical coach within the academy and later the women's setup as well. What, what, what would you say that your role as a technical coach included? Uh, and what was your day-to-day workload in terms of that? So, so it was a unique role. So basically what happened was Patrick Vieira come in to take the under-21s. So if I'm being honest with you, I, even though I was meant to come in and be the, the, the technical coach, I actually come in with the under-18s. So the under-18s at the time was the likes of Marco Lopez, Denis Suarez, uh, Olivia Rencham, who's at Celtic now, uh, Emma Hughes, um, the hell? Who else? Jack Byrne, who's got Shamrock Rovers. Um, we had a good group. We had a good group. So, so it was great because even though it wasn't the role what I was meant to be going in for, um, it, it, it was just like you're in. You're just up and running. Do you know what I mean? It was me and Jason Wilcox, who's the academy manager now, running that team. And we did all right. We did okay. We did okay, but... It was like you're coming in and it was a team which someone else already recruited and, you know, so you've got to deal with what you got till the end of the season. Then I left them working with the 18s as the coach and became them working, the technical coach, I started to work with players individually, collectively in small groups. And at that time, Man City were invested in the St. Bede's project, um, which obviously now starts at year seven. So, so they get told at year six whether they're going to get a scholarship we started at year nine, so they came in, you know, from the back end of year eight to year nine. So, you know, one thing we had was was some super, super, super talent in the building. And, and one thing which I was really wary of was was we had all these young, talented players who were like um, under, under 14s, 15s, 16s coming in and under 18s. And, and instead of them like always going, oh, he can't train with him because of physically, but Technically, it's not around the, the muscle mass. It's around your technique. It's around your, your preparation before you get the ball, your awareness. And it's, it's about repetition of actions, you know, within tactical moments within the game. And, and so what I then started to bring into the club was, well, do you know what? How inspiring is it for um, Phil Foden to go and train with, um, I can't remember who's in the under-18s at the time, but or the under-16s at the time, centre midfield, like... Sadu Diallo or Will Patchen or D'Amico Dulhaney, who's at Huddersfield now, Rafael Camacho, you know, who's at Lisbon now, who played for Liverpool, you know, that group, there's some super talent in there. And what I'm saying is, even though some of them were this like down here, playing with someone down here, these kids were like just, just pushing the older ones and the older ones were being pushed because they didn't want to get embarrassed, you know what I mean? And, and, yeah. You know, I, I remember having a group once. This is no word of a lie. I remember having a group, and the group was Phil Foden, Brahim Diaz, who played for AC Milan last night, uh, Felix Nemecha, who's made his first team debut, Rafael Camacho. Um, who else was in there? I think who else who's still playing at the minute? Who else is still in? Um, oh, Ikapozo. Ikapozo is there as well. They weren't the biggest group in the world, but do you know what? The bloody ball moved like a hockey puck across the ice, mate. It was like, boom, 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 boom. And and when I reflect and I still look at the footage now, I'm like going, wow. Like, I remember these plays being like this, you know, and, and that that was like a big part of my job was, was that. And then also, you know, sometimes, you know, it, it might be there's players who aren't, who aren't as confident as others at the minute. And, and you know... If they're in the programme, we've got to give every player the right chance and, and, and giving them time. So it wasn't just giving time to the players who we thought long term within the elite of the elite, you know, getting the time with me. It was also going, there might be someone else in here who just needs a little bit more. And we just need to make sure that we're not we're not writing anyone off. Do you know what I mean? Because yeah. the difference between a 13 year old and a 17 year old is massive, but Everyone can come late in different ways, technically, physically, psychologically, tactically. Do you know what I mean? And um, so I did that. Um, and at that time as well, the women's team was just launched. So then we started to get them in. Um, I mean, you're talking first professional contracts for Steph Horton, Lucy Bronze, Jill Scott, Tony Duggan, Izzy Christensen, Nikita Paris. You know, um, they, they had none of that. 
So we was then also as well thinking out the box for them, like incorporating them to like the under 15, 16 sessions, you know. Um, so then as time went on then, the 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 the, the remit, the, the staffing at the football club changed, new people come in, um, new people at the top changed, the overall programme changed, um, became very much similar to, to, to the Barcelona-esque, but different with the Man City turn on it. Um, because some of the work what was being done was unbelievable by the way prior to that so th they had to retain that so then I then went in then and became um, I still did work with the older ones quite a lot but then I just took a team then so I started to go back to the foundation phase again because the one thing what was different at Man City at that time was because there was a big bang about and we recruited the, we, 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 we got the best of the best talent at the time we had massive groups um, the level of the players were unbelievable for their age, the capacity to learn. So, and I really enjoyed working with them younger years because they were like sponges and the enthusiasm with them as well it was fantastic. Do you know what I mean? Um, so, I did that for a couple of years. Um, and then, obviously, then I went into working with the women full time, um, which was an unbelievable journey and, and you know there wasn't anything what we didn't accomplish by the Champions League you know got close to the, the final a couple of times but you know what one thing which I never thought personally and I still say to this day was in my life that I would have gone into women's football and, and I think women's football now whether I was to go back into it or go back into male or academy football you know when that time's right or first team football is you know the respect and the 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 um, the drive of some of them players is unbelievable. They they would show some male and young boys and you know what developing and hard work and dedication and it's about you know and um, you know I was lucky to work with some of the best in the world, you know. Um, to see some of the best in the world, you know, to hear the stories of how these players have got to where they are, you know, they've had it ten times harder than what what some of the you know the male and the academy boys had because everything was given to them, you know, they they were attracted to come, um, so yeah, unbelievable experience, um, and and I mean before just before I was at City, I should have said this before you said, I actually went to Israel. So, so when I finished at Blackburn, I did um, three months at Maccabi Tel Aviv in Israel. Um, and, and that was another learning curve, you know, and all these different places and the clubs and the places I've been, you know, the add up and, and you, you're in a certain mindset at that point. But then when you reflect back now, it's like you, you actually look at whether you're doing the right thing, whether you're doing too much of it. Um, but it's about learning. You've got to keep learning. You've got to keep developing. You know, you're only as good as what you've done, not yesterday, but what you're doing now. You know, one thing I always say to players is, is don't be a museum, be a factory. Keep producing, keep producing, keep producing. You know, I could sit back and go, yeah, I've had this player and I've done this and I've done that. Well, do you know what? They're doing what they're doing now, you know, and I'm always here for them, but... It's about the next players. You know, how can I inspire the next players? How can how can we craft a, a pathway for someone else to go and fulfil the career? Um, so yeah, that's that's me in a nutshell, mate. So how how do we build the technical proficiency within an, an individual and a club? Is, is it a culture, or, or and do they have to really buy into what the process is? I think, I think a big thing. It, it sounds crazy, this, but. <sighs> I see, you know, social media. Um, I see a million coaches working on there, and everyone does a great job developing players. And there isn't one way of doing anything. It's a way, not the way, you know. But I also think that the more thought, the more detail, the more specific at times you go, the more beneficial you're going to get for the player. And, and for football clubs to, to be able to do anything individually, it's hard because staffing, you know, 
you look at some of the lower league clubs, you know, how they produce players is unbelievable. I take my hat off to them because they might have one coach per 16 lads or 16 girls. So when you're blessed and you've got three, four coaches for a group of 20, you can really carve them up. Um, and, and that come down to budget, that come down to investment. Um, so, so, you know, one of the things for me now when people ask me to consult for them or when people want my advice and, you know, producing technical programs, which I've done for a, a club in Asia, uh, Japan, sorry, at the minute, is um, talking about, it's about, you know, you can repeat actions, but are them actions going to affect anything else in the game? It can look good. The player can be comfortable on the ball, but how does it affect it tactically? How does it affect someone on the right foot, on the left foot? You know, what, what, what's consistent as in your technical actions or, or before, during and after, do you want throughout the team, if it's a team what you're coaching? If it's not a team you're coaching and it's an individual, you've got to make sure that you're not going against the grain of what the football club, where that player's at. So, you know, certain people go, no, no, receive the ball like this. No, 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 receive it like this. Oh, it's okay, you can receive it like that. But then you've got certain clubs, for instance, there is like a specific way which they want the boys or the girls or the women or the men to receive the ball. So there's a lot more to think about on what people think about sometimes. And, and you know, I, I always say to players and I say to parents and I say to other people, coaches who come to me, I say it's harder to break a bad habit than it is to create a new good habit. But it takes, it's either way. It doesn't come overnight. It takes time. Um, so I think it's really important that, you know, you plan, you prepare, you deliver, you assess, and then you evaluate, you know, and then you do it again. It's like a circle. It just keeps going. Right. Mark, you, you've worked with some of the, the most gifted players of our generation. How much pressure does that put on you as a coach and as a person to continually develop, motivate, and inspire the next generation of players? I, I don't think it put pressure on you. I think, I think what it does is, is it's like um, one thing it gives you the ability to do um, is recognise similarities in other players to, to, to players what you've had previously. This lad is so much like this. This girl is so much like her. Um, at this point, she had to do this, this and this and this and it, it worked overnight or it... it, it, it you had to keep doing it for 12 months before you got an impact. So for me, it, it's not the pressure because I don't think I'm under pressure to produce any players because I'm not in a job working for a football club at the minute. Now, one thing I am is, is I'm here to help as many people as possible to, to, to guide them to having a career. Now, a big part of that is, is you know, where there is a little bit of pressure is is, you know, when you've got someone stood in front of you or I'm having a conversation with you, I know what you're doing exactly, exactly, every second of it. But it's when someone's not with you, it's having that discipline to maintain, to, to, to change the habits, to, to go out and practice the right things, to physically be doing the right amount, to be getting the right amount of, the right amount of rest. You know, um, it's the things off the pitch which make the difference for me. The hardest working player I've ever seen is a female. The most dedicated player I've ever seen is a female. Um, and, and that female was, she wasn't asked about anything other than football. That girl won Ballon d'Ors. She won World Cups. And do you know what? She wanted to go and win another Ballon d'Or. She wanted to go and win another World Cup. And she did it in the last World Cup with the women, you know. Um, and, and, and it's that constant drive, you know. It's that constant drive which... If I see someone like that, I latch onto that, and I'm sure they latch onto me because that's the way I am as a person, you know. Um, and and it's it's the key thing is, no matter what you've done, like I said to you before, to keep producing, you've got to keep producing, you've got to keep changing, because it's like anything, people adapt. If you keep adapting, everyone's always chasing you. As soon as you stand still, they're overlapping you, aren't they? Mark, before we start to sort of wrap up, as well as all the above that we spoke about, in 2018, you founded the Strong Hearts Foundation, which raises awareness of, of mental health uh, and awareness of cardiac arrest. It's not like you're busy enough anyway, but so what inspired you to set up the foundation and also how can people get involved? 
So, so the strong hearts was, um, so I had a cardiac arrest um, and uh, it, it wasn't severe, but it was a cardiac arrest. It, it was a massive, a massive part of my life, which, which, you know, put me through, put me through a lot. If I'm being honest, you know, I'm not going to lie, you know, mentally it, it, it hit me very hard. It took me away from wanting to do a lot of things. It took me away from this driven person who I am, it, it changed me, mate. And, and, and it was just because I was away from football, if I'm being honest, you know, that was the, that was probably one of the primary reasons. And, and, you know, um, I actually set it up in a hospital bed. And, and, and wow. so, so, you know, I was climbing the walls after the second day of being in there, being told by nurses, sit down, sit down, sit down. And I'm wanting to get out and get busy. And, um, basically I set a, um, Originally, I just set a charity game up, which was a fundraiser, which we got a lot of ex-professionals, celebrities to come in, um, in, in women's short, women's short amateurs at the time. And, and, we, and we, we raised some unbelievable money when the half that money went to the British Heart Foundation, half the money went to mine. So then we had a massive following, a huge following of people. People wanted to buy T-shirts. People wanted me to go and talk about all different types of stuff. But... I, there was a fine line between me becoming that fundraiser all the time, but then wanting to move forward with my own life. And then, so we did one more game. I thought, right, come on, then we'll do one more game, raise money again. And then because of, you know, the amount of young players I've seen over the years um, come into the game, fall out of the game, have things outside of football, which have things outside of football, which... Um, stopped them playing football, hindered the football, you know, um, that could have been illness, you know, could have been separation with them or the family, could have been something to do with the children, could have been done something to do with a brother or sister, you know, um, just just genuine not feeling themselves. So then we, we, we started some sessions on a Friday morning um, and it, it was crazy, mate. It was crazy because it was just an idea within the first day we had 30 players we had players who played in the Prem players who played in the Championship people who I'm looking up to you know going you know, I used to watch him play as a kid coming down wanting to get involved um, and, I, and it, do you know what it was it, 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 yeah we, we coached and we did a bit of work and we was lucky to bring some top people in to, to come and talk and inspire and motivate and then what actually started happening was these lads started to turn up week in, week out, week in, week out, week in, week out. So a two-hour session was turned into a three-hour session. Next thing, lads are going on trial at clubs, getting signed. Lads are going back into the league, getting contracts. Lads are getting back playing non-league football, getting signed, getting a couple of quid a week. And, and you know, we got nothing from that. You know, no one gave us a penny for that. You know, everything what was set up was set up through myself, just committing that time every week, committing that time to the lads. And I was still going up and down myself where I was at, just getting building myself back. But but it sounds crazy, but they really inspired me to get back doing what I do. And 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 the inspiration I was giving them, they were giving, you know, it's just bouncing back. So I thought this is something in my life for what I keep doing. Um so cut a long story short, um then just brands started to attached to us um you know charities started to attach to us other fundraising people wanted me to go and talk you know um i went to football clubs you know told them about my situation told them about other people's situation um we had a lot of people reach out to us a lot of people in the game a lot of people it started just like, like locally then it was like regionally then it went nationally like people from the top end of the country, from like Scotland down to London, do you know what I mean? Um, and, it, and it was just to say, listen, you know, everyone suffers with something at, the, at their life and at some point you will suffer. Now, some of you might have suffered 10 things already. Some of you might have had nothing. You know, you've got no bumps in the road yet, but it was, it was around, you know, a big thing of, look, you just got to keep going. You've got to keep working. Um, they were lucky to work with me and some other fantastic people in football who have been in the game and done a lot in the game and give their advice and time up. And and you know we've 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 got a pool of 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 males and females now, who you know 
some of them they don't want to go back playing football, but they've gone back into football coaching. They've gone back into football doing recruitment. They've gone back into football, you know, or teaching. It, it's inspired them. It's just give. If I'm being honest, it's give a few of them a kick up the arse to just go. I need to get my life back. And and it takes certain people to inspire, motivate, and ignite that. And it wasn't just me. It was the lads who were there trying to find that motivation. We're inspiring each other as well. Um, and it and it's brilliant. You know, it's brilliant what we've built. It's been hard during the COVID stuff to, to try and keep them lads going and keep them, you know, working. Um, but it, it's something which, you know, if people want to get in touch, you know, they can get in touch with me through Instagram. Um, and, you know, we'll try and guide you as much as we possibly can. Um, but it's something what we do do for free. It's something what we don't take any funds for. We don't ask for any fundraising for it if we do any fundraising that goes direct to the charities um and you know it's just listen in this day and age i think everyone every now and again might need a bit of help and you know that's what we tried to do through football is support people in that way not well, really really inspirational stuff um coming there and, and, and i am conscious of the time that i've taken off you this morning so before we finish with our quick fire question round what advice if any would you give to any coaches listening to this podcast Think about where you want to go. Think about why you're coaching. What's your reason for coaching? Why are you coaching? Is it is it to you know is it to just do what you're doing, or is it to to progress into something which is a little bit more um, serious for yourself? As in you know earning part time money, full time money. Where do you want to coach? What level do you want to coach? Do you want to run a business? Do you want to just be a part time coach? Do you want to be the best coach you can be? Do you want to be the best coach you can be? You're not going to get the money of if you run a business. So you've got to invest your time to, to develop yourself. Um, my, my biggest thing, what I say to a lot of young coaches is, knowledge is power. The more knowledge you've got when the time's right, the more you can demand if you're ever in a position where people want you to go somewhere. And, and you know, Pounds and pence, we all need it to live. But, you know, for three years, I did coaching for free at Crew. But then three years, the people I was stood next to, the, the conversations, the knowledge, the, the the way people I seen work, shaped me for life. And, and you know, the day the day when they said they want to pay me, I'm like, you sure? Because I didn't want to, I didn't want to stop that opportunity of working with them people. But I obviously shown people that was worthy of it um so it's 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 develop yourself keep learning like players if you don't keep learning the players don't keep learning and and just be aware you know be aware of what you want to do and where you want to go super mate time to put you on the spot just a little bit more um in terms of our quick fire question rounds it's not usually quick fire but we'll get through it as quick as we can um best coach you've seen work In what way? And one that's inspired you. Inspired me, Steve. Steve Holland, definitely, million percent. Steve Holland, someone who I had as a manager, as a coach, then I worked with him as a coach and a colleague, and and what an unbelievable person as well. Best friend in football. No, can't answer that. <laughs> Get it then. <laughs> um, there's. There's a few, mate. There's a few. I can't. If I if I put a name out, I'm getting hammered, so I can't can't do it. <laughs> no worries, don't worry. Uh, toughest opponent as a coach. Toughest opponent as a coach. Um, do you know what? That's something really. What I've not really. I've never really. I always concentrate on my team, so I'd look at what they've got, but I'd never look at the coach. So I'd always look at the players. So. Can't really answer that, if I'm being honest. No worries. Be best player you've coached? And I know you've worked with some fantastic talent, so it might be a bit unfair for you to, to label one. I think one of them who's up there at the minute, you've got me Phil Foden. Um, just, 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 you know, for not just his talent, but his background, where he comes from, you know, his love of the game, what he's shown people, if you're willing to work hard, if you're willing to 
to be intelligent. You know, size doesn't matter. You know, um, it, 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 it's it's how you solve problems. It's how her how hard you work both sides, being unpredictable. Um, and his drive, just his drive, and also he's a good person. He's, he's you know, he's a good person regardless of what people think. He's a he's a fantastic person, and and his feet are well and truly on the floor. But he's a young lad. He needs guidance. You know, he's gone from being a nobody to somebody overnight, um, and he's going to be a superstar. William Sant. Superb. What's been your best moment in football to date? Probably see my little boy play. See my little boy start that journey and, and, and you know, starting to really take it a bit more serious. And, and I think I think coming out of the game when you're in it full time, when you're on that wheel relentlessly, um, stepping back and watching and, 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 you know, football's my life. Everyone who's on a pitch, you want to win. You want to win. You want three points. You know you want your players to get better. But football is a big part of people's lives, and you know to see that smile on my little boy's face—that's that's the world to me, mate. Superb. Who's been your biggest role model or influence in football? Um, I've had a few. I've had a few. Steve was definitely one. Um, I think uh, David Lowe, who was at Blackburn, who's the assistant manager there now at the minute. When he was the head of coaching at Blackburn, he, he really made me more aware of myself and, and invested a lot of time in me, which I'd like to think, you know, he, he obviously thought that was worthwhile. Um, various people, you know, one thing outside of the clubs I was at was I was always meeting people for coffees, you know, Hedinburgh, who, who I mean, he's over in Cyprus, he won in Europa last night. Heading was someone I always tactically went for for advice um, outside of the clubs because sometimes you don't want to speak with people in the clubs. You want to have them external conversations and that was around the willingness to develop yourself. Um, but but they're just probably three people who, to mind straight away, you know, who spent a lot of time talking to. Describe yourself in three words. Uh Driven, um, obsessed at times, daft at times, if I'm being honest. Worst sense of humour you've ever seen. <laughs> Final one from us today is, is there anybody you would recommend or like to hear on the podcast? I think for, for the audience of people, if it's coaches, getting people on who's not just been in the game at the highest level but but people who've you know I think what what, what I really enjoy is, is is seeing people like say someone like Nick Cushion who's at New York City who I was at Man City with who used to work in school playgrounds used to go into schools you know but his love and his drive to develop himself you know whereas some people in football have never been in them situations, don't even know them situations, don't even know how you communicate to 30 kids who, when they're let out of a classroom, just have got that much energy, you, you don't know how to control them. So, you know, I think people like that, it brings you back down to normality because there's more people doing that than there is being on the training grounds at professional clubs, working with 20 players six days a week. You know, a lot of people who are refining the skills are probably or running businesses, they're working with hundreds of kids a week, you know, or hundreds of players a week. So it's it's um, it's having that variety, but having a a, I think someone who I think it's great for someone who's in the game or someone who's been in the game. But it's about the journey for me. I think I'm really interested in people's journeys and where they started. And like you said to me, the questions you've asked me, I think stuff like that's great. Superb. I mean, one of one of the reasons for the podcast is is for anybody who is listening, who, who see your success in the game, and you know the players you're working with, and how well you're doing. If they want to get there, an understanding of how you've got there, and, and maybe they can relate to some of the experiences you've had. But Mark, look, I, I can't thank you enough for taking the time today. Um, it's been superb. I've had goosebumps through listening for that, and you've certainly inspired me to go and be a better coach and a better person. I, I just want to say. 
and wish you all the best moving forward in your career and with the players that you're working with and, and enjoying your lad fall in love with this yeah, with this beautiful you. game that we all love and um, look forward to seeing more of you of your coaching and then um, stay safe mate and, and, and again thank you so much for taking the time today top top man mate top man top man cheers mark take see care later, mate. Speak thank you. see you in a bit cheers, mate. You. Bye. Bye, mate. hello we are tile central uk local tile stock is here on trentham tray box stanley matthews way our opening hours are eight till five in the week and saturdays till 12. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoy the content that we're trying to bring to you. Don't forget, new episodes will be released every Monday. You can find us on the iTunes store, Spotify, and if you want to see the video, you can see it on our YouTube channel, PCT Football Coaching.